Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Jeremy, and welcome to Cass City Missionary Church. Glad you guys made it. Guys, you guys, glad you guys remembered the time, and uh, we got a good crowd here, so that's really good. A lot of us are down at Brown City Camp, and uh, it's a great time. It's a missionary church uh, camp uh, for, the, for our region. It's their, their big camp, and there's a lot of people there, so I encourage you guys um, to come down and check a service out if you can. If you can make it to just one service, that's still great. Uh, every there's a lot to do, but, but every morning at 10 a.m. there's a service uh, in the main tabernacle, and at 7 p.m. there's a service. So if there's any, any nights you have free and you think, I don't know what to do tonight, just drive on down to Brown City at 7 o'clock and, and check out a service, and you won't be disappointed. Uh, it's, it's well underway. We're, it started Thursday, and it goes all the way through next Sunday, so um, it's really great. It's um, definitely not a vacation down there. They challenge you. We got some great speakers down there, and they challenge you to grow in your faith and uh, this Paul Epperson is is he's kind of starting to camp off and he's doing the services uh, till tomorrow and then Adrian Dupree comes in and Adrian Dupree was there a couple years ago and he's uh, high energy I guess to say the least you're not going to fall asleep at 7 p.m. At, at, at Brown City Camp when Adrian Dupree's there very high energy former football player uh, just a great speaker so uh, come on down if you can. Uh, while we're here, uh, these two weeks, in the past couple of years, Pastor Phil has taken this opportunity, these two Brown City Camp weeks, uh, to do a Summer in S- of Psalms uh, series, or kind of just look at the book of Psalms, and because I don't have any other great ideas, I figured we'd do that do that this year too. So maybe next year we'll change it, but not this year. So um, so we want to look at uh, some of the Psalms, and, and uh, today we're going to start with Psalm 1, the very first Psalm, and these aren't in chronological order. Uh, they, they're, they're a collection of psalms, or maybe you could call them poems or prayers or hymns, uh, and they're put together uh, and arranged by, by somebody after they're written. So it's not chronological order. You don't read them 1 through 150 and, and they'll go right in order. Um, they're kind of organized, if you will. So um, psalms is the largest book in the Bible, if you go by verses. Now, we had a youth group at Lamont that... I said, we talked about the shortest book, and they got, is it, is it the shortest by words? Is it the shortest by verses? Is it the shortest by chapters? If you go by verses, uh, Psalms is, a, is the biggest book. If you, if you want to argue about words and uh, Hebrew characters, then you probably could go to Jeremiah, I think. And, but, but just <sighs> don't be like the youth group. And just understand Psalms is the biggest book of the Bible. There's a lot in there. And Psalm 1, we're going to find out, starts with, the blessed one, we're blessed, blessed are we. And then Psalm 150 ends with praise God. So we're blessed to be God's people, so praise God. And in between there is every human emotion, every human circumstance, every ups and downs of the world that you can find in this book. And it's a list of prayers or hymns or songs, you might say. Um, And they say that the theme of Psalms is life is hard, but God is good. So no matter where you're at, no matter how you're feeling today, I guarantee you there's a psalm made for you. Because in between, we're blessed and praise God is every human emotion captured in these psalms. So psalms are a great spot to, to, to read the Bible. If you're looking to read the Bible, if you want a daily devotion, just read through the psalms. It'll get you halfway through the year and then just do it again. Because um, life's hard, but God is good. And that's what psalms talks about. So we're going to look at the first one, Psalms 1, and it's divided, the book's divided into five different uh, sections maybe, and Psalms 1 and 2 is kind of an introduction to the whole thing. So we're going to look at this introductory psalm, Psalm 1, uh, and if you want to summarize uh, the whole psalm, it's only six verses, but you'd actually start at the bottom and work your way up. Um, the verse 6 says, for the Lord, and we read it already, the Lord watches the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. And this verse tells us exactly what the psalmist wants to communicate, that there's a, I'm going to move this back, that there's a, uh, there's a conflict, there's a contrast between the two paths that we can take. And we all have a choice. There's two paths. There's the way of the wicked, and there's the way of the righteous. And we get to decide what one we're going to choose. We're going to decide what way we're going to walk. The way of the world, and the godlessness, and the wicked, or the way of the righteous and the godly. Uh, and that's exactly what the author wants to communicate. And then we don't know exactly who wrote this psalm. Uh, chances are, if we don't know who it is, they say David because he wrote half of them. But there are many others that wrote the book, of, uh, wrote a psalm that's in the book. So we can't say David for sure. But we know that the author wants to, to tell us and to force us to figure out, like, who is the righteous and what do they do 
and what do they look like? And who are the wicked? And what do they do? And what do they look like? And that's what we're going to capture. So we're going to read this psalm together, uh, just straight through. Actually, I'll just read it, not, not all at once. It's short enough that we can get right through it. It's six verses. We'll read it front, front to, to uh, back, and um, then we'll talk about it. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. But those who delight in the law of the Lord, and those who meditate on its law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whether they do, whatever they do prospers, not so the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor the sinners the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. All right. So there's two types of people that is being addressed, right? There's the righteous and the wicked. And, and, and this psalmist starts by talking about the righteous first. And they're defining the righteous not by what they do or what they look like or the things they do, but um, by what they do not do. And it starts with the blessed is the one. And now the one is not saying blesses the man or blesses the woman or blesses the child or blesses the rich or blesses the poor. It's blessed the one, not, the, not one specific type of people, not one specific group. It's the one, which means we all can be the one. We're all included. One can be a very plural uh, word. and it, We usually use it as singular. One is singular. And I could be the blessed one, for sure. But collectively, we could be the blessed one together. We all have the opportunity. That's good news. It means that you and I could be the blessed one. You could be the blessed one. I could be the blessed one. It's not just blessed as men, blessed as women, blessed as children, blessed as the rich. It's blessed as the one, anyone, any one of us, or hopefully all of us are the blessed one. We can collectively be called blessed, which means you could be the blessed one, I could be the blessed one. Together as a church, we could be the blessed one. And who doesn't want to be blessed? I mean, that's good news. That's good news for all of us. But the question is, how do we get blessed? And how do we become the blessed one? And the psalmist defines who the blessed one is, not by what they should do, but by what they will not do. And the three things that the blessed one or the righteous one will not do is they will not walk and step with the wicked. They will not stand in the way that sinners take. They will not sit in the company of mockers. The blessed one will not do certain things. They won't walk a certain way. They won't um, go down a certain path. They won't stand in certain company, and they won't sit with certain people, which means that there's always two ways to go. If they're not going to go that way, then there's a way for them to go. There's always one, leads, one way which leads to blessings and one, laid, one way which leads to destruction, which is verse 6. And the company that we keep will tell us a lot about whether we're living in the way of the righteous or we're living in the way of the ungodly or the wicked. The righteous will not do the things that the ungodly do. They will not walk. And some would say that, that you, you would equate this, they will not step or they will not walk and step or they will not think like the wicked. And some would say that they will not stand in the way that sinners stand or take would mean they will not behave the way that sinners behave. And those that won't sit in the company of mockers, which means that they don't belong in the company of mockers. They don't make that their, their identity. And it's the progression that, that, that sin takes. First we walk with them and we think like them. Then we linger there and we entertain it for a little while and we stand around with them and we're in the same path that they're in and we kind of uh, take on their counsel and they take on their behaviors and we start to look and act like them a little bit. And finally, we're comfortable enough that we sit there and we dwell with them and we, and we uh, look to them for solely our only counsel and, it looks, and we start to look like them and behave like them and then we belong with them and we become identified with that group. It's a progression. And we as blessed people are called to walk a different path. And so to understand the walk, uh, this, this walk, stand, sit progression, we have to start with discerning what's godly and what's wicked. What is the worldly and what is the way that we should go? And I found, and I don't know if you found this or not, that if, uh, if I have a problem and I make that problem public, 
like people are going to give me their opinions about that problem. They're going to give me their advice. Like, I don't know if you guys have the same problem I do, but like, say I have an issue in my life and I make that public, I will not have any shortage of counsel. People love to share their opinions. And say if I would do this and I would never would do this, if I went to Facebook and I just published my problem on Facebook, within minutes I'd have a hundred answers of what way to go. And that's when the work starts. You have to decide which way is the godly way and which way is the, the way of the wicked. Which counsel is good godly counsel or which counsel is worldly counsel? Within minutes, I'd be flooded and I'd have to decipher how am I going to walk? Which way am I going to go? And in order for us to be blessed, righteous people, we have to get to work in those instances when we have problems. We have to, instead of just taking everyone's advice or the ones that maybe make us feel the best in our flesh at the moment, we have to decide and we have to ask simply, God, help me discern what way to go. Is this godly advice? Is this wise counsel? If I sit around and I, and I stew on these thoughts that I'm telling to think, is it going to lead me to a good place or is it going to lead me to a harmful place? What, be, what behavior do I have to take if I listen to their advice? Is it going to be behavior that's godly or behavior that looks like the wicked? And the more you take the advice of the ungodly or you stand in the way and seek out their company or the more you sit with them, the more you belong to that group and the more you look like that. But we have a choice. We can take the ungodly advice and the wicked advice um, that will lead us to behave like the ungodly and we risk making that the place in which we dwell and that the place of which our identity is. Or we can discern the advice and see if it's godly and take godly advice which leads us to act in a godly manner and belonging in godly company and taking on the identity of the sons of God. And it's easy to, to find yourself sitting in the company of mockers. And some versions will say the seat of scoffers. You take up a, a, a seat with the mockers or the scoffers. It's easy to find yourself in there in this world today. We're everywhere. We're in the church. We're outside the church. We're in the world. And we scoff and we mock at a lot of different things. It's easy to realize you're there and you're like, how do I even get to the spot? How am I even there? And some, sometimes it's obvious and we're not comfortable there. I worked for a business and... Uh, because I was one of the managers, I often, every other manager at this business was an owner. So I often found myself at the table with these owners of the business and me. And these owners uh, scoffed and mocked Christians quite a bit. And they, they openly did it in meetings. They openly would say Christians are useless and, and are biased and can't have any use to businesses. And uh, I found myself sitting with these scoffers, but I wasn't comfortable. That wasn't a comfortable spot for me to be. It wasn't where I desired to be. I didn't identify with them. I didn't join in with them. It was very uncomfortable. I knew, I'm like, I don't belong here. This isn't my place. But oftentimes, and there are many times I find myself, and I'm sure you guys find yourself in the midst of scoffers who are targeting something that I kind of agree with. Maybe it's the government. Maybe it's the leadership of the church. Or maybe it's the leadership of the denomination. Maybe it's the leadership of the city. Maybe it's the boss at work. And they're scoffing and they're mocking. And you're like, yeah, I can. I get that. You know, I I can join that. Like, I understand that. That's that's a good thing to do, and it's done openly. And Christians are sometimes mocking other Christians, or maybe one political party is mocking the mocking the other one and scoffing at the other one. And I can join into that. It's easy for me to sit at that table. It's a little more comfortable than I would like to admit. I can join into that. But here we're told that the blessed one does not take up that company. It doesn't say uh, the blessed one will sit only in the company that mocks the right kind of people, and then you're good. The, the, the blessed one will sit in the company that scoffs at certain leadership because they're bad anyway, right? We know that. No, it says we don't take up that type of company. We don't get comfortable in that sitting at that table. We're told the blessed one doesn't take up that company. He doesn't allow those thoughts. He isn't standing in the path of those people waiting for them to come by and commiserate with them. He's walking in the opposite direction so that he'll never end up in the same room, let alone the same table with them, because he's going a different way. He's taking a different path. And in these moments when we're, when we're walking and we're thinking, we're trying to decide where to go, we have to choose. We have to choose what path we're going to take. The path that leads to mocking and scoffing or the one that leads the opposite way and leads to speaking life. And what path we, path we choose often starts with a thought. What thought we're going to entertain in our head and, and one person could just say one negative thought, and I could say, yeah, I agree with that. And that leads us down that path. And, and people lead us astray often. But I think 
more often than not, more times than that's the case, it's our own thoughts that lead us down the path of the wicked. It's our own problems that we're trying to solve in our own way that will get us down this path um, of self-righteousness. Seeking our own way and our own problems and, and finding our own way to our, our own table where we can mock and scoff people. And it starts with our own thoughts. And maybe it's the thought of, um, yeah, I can drink that. I, I'm, it's, I'm legal to drink that. That's fine. Or uh, it, we're, we're, We can look, but we can't touch. So that website isn't really that bad. Or I can smoke when I want, and no one can really tell me otherwise. It's my body I can choose. Or um, that political party's wrong, so if these people argue about that, that's okay. And we can, could justify all these different thoughts that we put in our own mind that allowed us to lead down the path of the wicked. And once we tell ourselves that that, that, that that thought's okay to have, we give ourselves permission to head down this path and to, to find people that are like that and to find a spot to linger long enough to gather, to stand around in, in that sin and, and justify why we're there or how we're there. And sooner or later, we're engaging in that behavior and, and taking on that identity of whatever sin or whatever company we're seeking. We get comfortable. We, we pull up a seat and we sit, we sit there. And if we sit there long enough, that starts to become who we are. That starts to become our identity. And then when I think of this progression of how this happens, I think of Lot in the Bible. I, I don't know if you guys know Lot. He, he, in Genesis 13, Abraham and Lot were headed down the same path. They were going the same place. But they, they, both their um, families and possessions got too great that they're like, this isn't going to work. We're too many people. We have too many livestock. We've got to split up and so Abraham, being a righteous man, said, Lot, you take wherever you want to go. Go and, and find your land, and we'll take our land, and uh, we'll just kind of live separately. And Lot said, I'll take the east. I'm headed out east, and, and that away he went. And in Genesis 13, 12, it says, Lot pitched his tent near Sodom. Now, Sodom was filled with wicked people. We know that if we know the Old Testament story. It was filled with wicked people, but, but Lot said, I'm going to pitch my tent here because something about Lot was appealing or something about Sodom was appealing to Lot. And he pitched his tent close to Sodom so he could see Sodom. He thought, something about that city. Yeah, I know there's wicked people there, but uh, I can somehow benefit from this and being around them. And he pitched his tent around there. And um, it didn't turn out well for him. Right away, Sodom and some other countries, or some other nations said, uh, all right, kings, we've got to get together because we have one ruling king and we don't like him, so we're going to rebel against them." Well, they weren't strong enough, and the king came and conquered Sodom and these other these other nations, and who got swept up in all of that was Lot. Because he got close to them, and, and he, he, he uh, thought that somehow they were good people to be around, that Sodom's problems became Lot problem, Lot's problems. And he got swept up in all that. And Abraham, Abraham had to come and uh, free him from that, and he did, because Abraham's a bad dude, and he took some bad dudes, and they went and, and conquered and, and freed them. But he didn't learn from his mistakes. Then angels of the Lord said, you know what, Sodom and Gomorrah, just, they're still not good, and we're going to destroy them. We're going to come down, and we're going to destroy them. And Abraham said, will you, will you save at least Lot, please? Help, you help me out. And there's a whole conversation he has with them. And the angels go into the city, and the first one they find was Lot sitting at the, the gate. The gate's a spot where like the city council members sat, like the places of honor, the places of dignity within the city, and that's where Lot found himself sitting. Do you see the progression of this? Um, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a progression that Lot took. He took a thought that somehow pitching his tent next to Sodom would be good. He knew they were worldly. He knew they were wicked people. But he thought, there's something in that world for me. There's something I can gain from it. So this is okay. I'm going to gain from these people. They're wicked. And that led, them, that led him to standing into their path and getting to know them and building trust in them and, and earning their trust. And finally, he started to belong to Sodom, so much so that these wicked people view Lot as someone that they could trust and they could honor and they could exalt into a place of authority in their city. He belonged there. He went from belonging with God's people to belonging with the wicked. And of course, we know that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Lot was spared because of Abraham, but the wicked in the city were destroyed. And that's where Lot found himself belonging. He went from a thought to I can gain something to I'm just going to kind of get to know him and, and do business with them and see how it goes to being in that city, being in the gates, being in the city council. 
That's one path that we can take. There's another, though. We, we can discern with the path of the wicked and discern the path of the godly. But in order to discern what way to go, what path is right, we have to know what's good and what's bad. And the only way to know that is Scripture. The only way to know the godly places, the godly path, is to know our God through His Scripture. The two things that the blessed... Um, the blessed or righteous do to ensure that they'll discern the path correctly is to delight in the, the law of the Lord and then meditate on the law. We're told that the, the Word of God, we're told to know the Word of God and to meditate on it. Not just to read it and, and say, oh, that's cool, and forget about it, to meditate on it, to, to stew on it, to, to dwell on it, to think on it. The blessed one doesn't walk in the, the path of the wicked, but he delights in God's Word and he thinks about it. And when we delight in something, we're not told we have to do it. When we delight in something, it's not a chore to do it. When we delight in something, we do it willingly, and we do it joyfully. My kids delight in junk food. And we're at Brown City Camp this week, and uh, April learned this trick a, a couple years ago from her friend. Is uh, We have kids, we have five kids, and they have friends, and their friends come over to our camper sometimes at Brown City Camp, and you can't buy enough groceries for those situations. And we will buy junk food. I mean, just a ton of chips, a ton of cookies. And all it takes is one herd of teenagers to come in and whirlwind around and leave and all your food for the week is gone. Like, you guys know that, right? That's all it takes is one afternoon. And, all, and that's what we found the first year we were there. We we're like, we had food for the week and it's all gone because they all had one little powwow at our place, which we love them to come over. But we said, we can't do this. Like, <laughs> we don't make a lot of money. So what we decided to do, and April learned this trick from her friend, is we get bins with each of the kids' names on it, and we fill them up with junk food, and we say, all right, Isaac, here's your bin. Thomas, here's your bin. Mackenzie, here's your bin. And we have five bins. Actually, we have seven because we have a couple other kids staying with us. Uh, and their names are on them, and we say, that's your junk food for the week. That's what you get. When you're out, you're out. Like, there's enough in there for a week. That's you. You can't eat from anyone else's bin. You can't eat their junk food because when the teenagers come, then the little kids are like, we didn't even get anything. They all have their bin, and that's all they can eat. We never once have to tell them, you better eat all your junk food by the end of the week. Look at your bin. It's still full. They delight in eating junk food. We don't have to tell them to eat the junk food. They come and they're like, oh, what can I have? Oh. And some of them will get smart and say, I'm only going to eat one cookie a day or I'm only going to have one thing a day that way I have enough. Or, um, we never have to remind them to eat that somehow. They delight in it. We're told we should delight. The blessed one delights in reading God's word. The blessed one delights in knowing what path to go and hearing the word. And how much, I think it's fair to say that how much we delight in being the son of God, the son's and heirs with Jesus, how much we delight in that is how much, you can measure it by how much we delight in being in the Word. I'm not saying that to condemn you, because I know that there's some here, and, and, and we're, we're the faithful. We're here at Brown City Camp Week here at church. But I know there's some that say, you know what, I, Jeremy, you keep saying, you read the Word, but I really haven't read it much this week. And if I'm being honest, I don't know if I've read it much this month. And it was my New Year's resolution, but if I look back in the year, I probably haven't crack my Bible open too much. And so I'm not saying that to condemn you. I'm saying that to say that we should delight in that as people of God, as the blessed ones. But don't condemn yourselves if you don't delight in the Word. Don't let the enemy tell you that somehow you're not a Christian, you don't love God, you're worthless, you, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Because chances are when you, when you go down that road, it's not going to help you out of it. Instead, because you love God, because you're the children of God, because you're striving to do your best in the world, but you just somehow that delight in the Lord isn't there fully, make it part of your prayer life. Your daily prayers say, God, help me. Give me that delight in my soul for your word. God, give me that desire and that earning to, to know which way I should go, to hear from you. Make it part of your daily prayer life because I believe God honors those prayers. And I believe if you, what you pray about, you focus on, and you do. Instead of beating yourself down and saying, yeah, there you go, another message about reading the Word, and I just don't do it because I don't like to read. Reading is hard for me. I fall asleep every time I read. I have all the excuses. I could, say, I could tell you all the ones I have, too. 
ask God to give you a delight for his word. Ask God to give you a delight for the knowledge of the path that we should take. Ask God to make you the blessed one that delights in reading his word and getting to know him. And that might mean you have to take some action. That might mean if that's your thought, you have to make a behavior, which means you might have to come talk to me and we'll get you in some type of men's group or women's group or Bible study group, focus stolen. Maybe you guys will be starting one or some type of accountability. Come talk to me. We'll get you in the word and we'll set up a system that will help you be accountable for reading that. It might be the stuff you have to take instead of just saying, God, help me out. Oh, no, okay, you didn't help me there. Help me again. No, don't help me again. Sometimes there's steps we have to take to get there. We can make it our purpose to gather and just read the word. We do it on Tuesday mornings, so maybe you're free Tuesday mornings. You could come and do it with us. Uh, many groups throughout the church are doing it. We can plug you into one or you can start one. I mean, it can be an accountability just for you because blessed is the one who delights in the word and thinks about it often. And what's the blessing that comes? Like, what's the blessing that we get? What does it mean to be the blessed one? just from delighting and knowing God's word? Well, the blessed one won't lead, be led down the path that leads to destruction, but it will be firmly planted and directed on the path that leads to life. In verse 3, it says the person, the blessed person, the one that delights in the word and thinks about it often, is like a tree planted in by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so for the wicked, they are like the chaff that the wind blows away. So how are you guys feeling like a tree full of life producing fruit? Do you have healthy, healthy leaves? Do you feel like you're healthy? The tree that's planted by the streams is left wanting nothing because it's constantly being fed, constantly being filled. The blessed one that delights in the word is constantly being filled. Its leaves can't wither. It's... it's, it's um, um, Fruit doesn't go dry. It never becomes chafe. It never gets blown around by the wind. It never feels empty and useless and lost. It's firmly planted where it's supposed to be. And it's strong and it's full of life. Do you feel like that? Or do you feel dried up? Do you feel like you're just running on empty? So many oftentimes going to Brown City Camp, people say, oh, I need this so bad because I'm running on empty and camp just fills me up. Well, we dedicate 10 days and we go to two services a day and we read the Bible in between and there's afternoon services. We feel like that tree planted by the streams for at least 10 days. And then a month later, we feel pretty dried up. The one that delights in the Word and meditates often doesn't need a camp to refill them. They have a stream of life coming into them every single day. They're not starving in their life. They're not empty. They have a renewed delight each and every day. And maybe you need to renew your delight in the Lord and spend some more time in the Word. And maybe you need to uh, freshen up your branches and, and uh, spruce up your fruit a little bit. The best way to do that is to get in the Word. Or maybe you're completely lost and you don't even know which way is right anymore. You've been on the wrong path for so long, and you think that you're on the right one, but every time you turn around, there's more problems than everywhere you go. You're getting terrible advice, and you're like, well, that might be good, so I'm going to act on it. And you're kind of getting blown around from here, one person to the next, and you're like, this just got to be the right way to go, but then you just feel like the path you're on leads to more emptiness than it does life. Seek out the wise and the godly and those that are planted. Find a tree that's producing fruit. Seek them out and ask them, to help you. Come to me. Uh, uh, make that your daily prayer that God help me renew my delight in the Lord and, and the word of the Lord. And come to me for some accountability and we'll get you hooked up with some people that will help you be accountable. Because God desires all of us to be his blessed people. God wants to bless us in, 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 in the ways that we walk. He wants to bless us in where we stand. He wants to, to bless us where we take up our seat and we, we become comfortable at In order for us to receive that blessing, we need to delight in his word. We need to delight in being in his presence. And that we know that we know that we're on the path that at the end is going to lead to life and not destruction. Psalms is a great book to start with. I said it before. Every despairing thought you have is found in Psalms. Every victory in Jesus you have is found in Psalms. Every sadness and every joy, I mean, every emotion you could have, you can connect with them. And finally, I'd say that the psalm is also hinting at 
There is a blessed one who came to save us from the path of destruction. Jesus is the blessed one. Through him, we get to be a blessed one, but he is the blessed one. He is the one um, that can take us from that wide path of destruction and put us on the narrow path of life. He's the one by simply believing and putting our faith in his life and his death and his resurrection can change us and change the path we're on and change our identity from the wicked to the righteous. We get to be the blessed ones because he was the blessed one that came for us. So as the band comes up and uh, we, we're going to head into a time of communion. And I didn't mention that for you guys at home. Uh, maybe you need to pause it. you got a few minutes here to run and get some elements. But as the band comes up uh, and, and the deacon and deacons come up, we're going to receive the elements and we're going to come down the middle. We're going to get the elements. We're going to take them back to our seats. And um, it's going to be a time, I hope, that we can reflect on where we're at. We can assess the path that we're at. We can assess that we're, how we're feeling today. Do we feel full of life? Are, are our leaves uh, green and bright? Is our fruit ready and ripe? Are we feeling a little bit withered and tired and lonely? Are your thoughts that of godly thoughts? Like, do your thoughts lead you to behavior that you know God wants you to do? Or do your thoughts kind of hint at you to, to just, you know, take the side road a little bit and go over here and you know what you can do over there and you'll rejoin the past sometime other, uh, somewhere along the way and just take a, to, just, just ask where you're sitting now. Like, where am I sitting? Am I sitting at a place that I belong in the kingdom of God? Like, this is where I, this is where I belong. This is where I'm most comfortable. Or do we get a little too comfortable among the mockers and scoffers? Do we speak life in the, and the people, with those, those that were around, are we speaking life into them and encouraging them? Or are we satisfied with mocking and scoffing at the world around us? Use this time as we come forward and the band plays to grab our elements and just reflect on the blessed one, Jesus. And what he's done for us, that he's pulled us out of the path of the wicked and he put us on the path of the righteous. He made it possible that we can delight in the word of the Lord because of the joy that he gives us when we believe in him. So as the band starts and, and um, we grab our elements and we turn to our seats, uh, good, good, good time to reflect on what path we're on and, and delight in the fact that we get to be the blessed one. Like, that's what we get to do. That should bring us joy. So come on forward.